I wanted to put these in the last one I did of uh, Tama, but I, I couldn't find them. And so when I did find them, why well, I, I thought I would uh, have another picture book here. There may be some of these that you've seen before, but uh, a Thai plant has an interesting history. Uh, they started building it just before World War II started. And uh, because of needing uh, large pipes for water, they need a lot of water at a Thai plant. Why uh, they had to go, and I will show the screen, uh, they had to go to the government in order to get that. Hmm. So anyway, uh, it was started in 42, as I said, and uh, they had to get the help of their local senator and the government felt that a tie plant was necessary for the war effort. So by December 42, the plant was ready to start operations with one of the large treatment uh, cylinders or retorts. They were only there four short years and the plant had three retorts. At the time of installation, they had a 132 foot long retort, which was the longest in the United States. And the plant had several 100,000 gallon tanks, which are still there today. And they now are used for uh, uh, black uh, petroleum for the asphalt. So you, Union Pacific brings in train load of cars just for that particular industry. It may be the only industry between Marshalltown and Cedar Rapids is still on the rail. Anyway, it, it made ties mainly for the Milwaukee, the Northwestern, and the M and St. L, and poles for AT&T. And in 1960, it was gone completely. The problem was <coughs> there was so much drainage that went down into the river that the river was dying. And so they closed the plant up, tore it all out except for those big tanks. And that was the end of the tie plant. So this is a few pictures of the tie plant. Here's that big retort being unloaded. Now what, what's that actually used for? Is that what they, they soak the stuff in or? It isn't soaked. You, you put in a car, uh, they have a, a track, a railroad track inside. So they have small cars that they put the ties on the cars and they pull them in there and fill that up. Then they put in a, a, a certain amount of uh, creosote and water and then they uh, pressurize that tank and that pushes that creosote into the wood. Okay. So it's a massive uh, pressure cooker, if you want to call it that. Yeah. And here comes in the second one. So if we need a, a uh, flat car load for your railroad, <laughs> That's on three flat cars. You don't have to have the tie plant, but it's kind of neat to have the uh, bring the you know run the retard around once in a while. Sure. Yeah. Their little old six zero steamer. Even though one of these is above the other, they had tracks that went into the top one also. And they, there's their crane uh, that they uh, they had a mammoth area just for nothing but ties stacked there weathering out. This building over here is the cob shed that uh, where they uh, Quaker Oats bought cobs for 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 all. And I think I might have some more pictures of that, which is a chemical. <coughs> So here's a couple of more different pictures of the paper mill, which, as I said before, they uh, uh, they made uh, egg case fillers. They, they were uh, gray and and uh, they made them out of straw and paper. Different picture. This might be the Milwaukee over here because I think it's on the west side. The Northwestern came in too, but 
in the other pictures, I think that was a Northwestern. In 1918, they had a massive flood. One of the creeks, uh, they have flash floods coming out of the hills north of Tama. And this area uh, got all underwater and uh, stopped everything. And so we have a few pictures of the flood. That's the tower. This probably is uh, the Milwaukee track. That's that was what happened. I, I changed that. Anyway, it's not the Northwestern track. This is the Milwaukee here. There's the tower. The Northwestern is over here. See the, the tower for the Northwestern. I have to change that back. And here's another picture of that. Here's the Tama Northwestern Depot here. So somebody's at the, the paper mill taking a picture back. There's the hotel. Now we were out there, Willie and I was out in 93. And of all things, there was another flood, the same kind of a flood. And uh, it was interesting to see that uh, uh, signal, you know, working there. I suppose it got shorted out. Yeah. It was occupied. <laughs> flashing away. Yeah. Keeping everybody off the flood. <laughs> you can see all the corn stalks and stuff that's come down the creek. Yeah. What a mess. This is a couple of pictures of the different manufacturers that were there. The reason that they were there was because they had a water. Uh, uh, a, um, water to make electricity with and uh, I, they had several big factories at the time. Here's the, the that Quaker Oats that we saw in the other picture. And as I said, they, the, the cobs are made into furfural, which is an organic compound and uh, made from agricultural byproducts, including corn cobs, oats, wheat, bran, sawdust. It's used as an important renewable non-petroleum-based chemical feedstock. And we, they had a large cob business there and so did uh, uh, Belle Plain. But fate is, it was a local guy and it was the first time I'd ever seen a truck that big, I was not very old, a large tandem wheel truck that he came to the farm and as we were shelling corn, why he picked up all the corn cobs. I doubt if they paid us for it. It was probably a way to get rid of the corn cobs. And of course, here's the Neal Creamery, which was big in uh, the blue ribbon butter, processed eggs and poultry. And they leased a bunch of Northwestern cars uh, for their product. I'd love to get the original picture there, which would have been better. And of course you see that's got six cars there, whether that was their total fleet or not, I don't know. That car has been brought out by uh, one of the manufacturers and there was uh, decals available to it. So here's a picture of the, the town. You know, this, the town itself is right in here. Here's the Milwaukee Railroad coming in. Here's the Northwestern Railroad coming in. And here's the Northwestern Depot. Milwaukee Depot is over here. What's interesting down here is all this pattern down here. And, you know, people wonder what that is. Well, this is a big uh, lumber yard. And this is how they were unloading cars. And then I guess that made the different paths for bringing lumber into the actual mill itself or storage unit and uh, Spawn and Rose was a big company all over Iowa at the time. This railroad here is the Milwaukee. Remember, this is a Northwestern. The Milwaukee comes down out of the picture, comes around like this, comes over here. And as the Milwaukee crossed the Northwestern, then this ended up on the other side. Now the Northwestern line coming in is right through here. And down in here, there's actually a crossing down here where the two railroads crossed each other.
that's the best picture that I could come up with is of the uh, elevator. And uh, Beal had an elevator on the uh, Northwestern. He rented it from him or leased it from him. But he also had an elevator on the Milwaukee, which is, uh, it is right there, I think. It's a little hard to find in here because I don't have quite all the pictures. It's another one of just the uh, scale house. And all of these, these buildings here and behind the boxcar, those are all coal sheds. But the elevator business was big in coal at that time. And there's a picture of Main Street. So we move up in time a little bit. Everything was brick, still brick today. I don't think you have much trouble finding parking places there today, though. <laughs> it's a typical, you know, town that is has went down to a couple of taverns and uh, uh, not much else. At one of the gas stations, just the other day, uh, uh, Maynard had a, no, it was Ma uh, Mont that had a, well, Maynard too, they had a station exactly this of this type, mm -hmm. which pretty typical stations in the 50s. The, the guy who last had it was a Pelham and he had a record. He was the only two the guy in town. He had, uh, he, he, you know, he had two records really, and that was it. There's the Clifton Hotel, which was, of course, the largest. Tama had many hotels. Many of them were really small, more or less, boarding houses. They had two pretty good sized motel hotels. There's the two latest ones, which is a central one. Here's notice how the trees have grown around the Clifton. There it is with the trees around it. Here it is without the trees around it. <laughs> All these trees really got big, didn't they? That's one thing most of us don't model is a building with trees that large in front of it. That's a sale barn. All the uh, farmers bringing in their uh, livestock to be sold. And this be is the crossing of the Milwaukee and the Northwestern. We're looking down the Northwestern and a Milwaukee train coming in and going to cross here. Banjo type signal. A lot of rods. If you want to model that, why you need the rods, even if they don't work. And this has nothing to do with Tama, but I found this picture and I thought it was really neat. That's the end of the railroad right there. <laughs> it stops right there. I guess they just backed up. I don't know, you know, how long the branch was or what, but anybody know where Lancaster is at? Ron, Lan Lancaster is in far southwest Wisconsin. It comes all the way from Whitson Junction, which I'm modeling, is south of Fenimore. Hmm. It, so it's that's the very far end of the Chicago Northwestern. Wow. So over there on the left, you see the building that says they have coal, lime, and, and. I don't know what else. <laughs> there's a box car in front of it. I just thought that was a pretty neat picture. I'm yeah. not sure where I got it. Maybe, Rod, I got it from you. I don't know. And that's the end of that one. All right, let me see here what I got to do. Stop sharing. You want another one? Well, it looks like Mark is back. Mark, you want to give it a try here? Well, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Never a sure thing. Me and technology really don't get along very well. 
Well, let's see if I can share my screen and get something here. We, we can. All right, this, okay. So I, can everybody see that? Yeah. Yes. All right, so I always look forward to whatever you guys are posting every day. And I don't know, a week or so ago, I posted a little bit about these temporary scenery extensions. And here's a, my layout is eight by 24 feet. And it's around the wall. So the track is, the center line of the track is three to six inches away from the fascia edge, which a lot of times means it's difficult to take photos because the edge is always in the way. So I decided I would try and do something about that and make an extension that I could set up and then take down so I could take pictures around the layout. So as an example, here is one end of my layout. I'd like to take a picture of that train, but the fascia is always going to be in the way. So I built this curved fascia extension that I can add temporarily there, and it's just held up by a, a clips. And now I can take a picture. I'm looking across the scenery extension, then I can take it down when I don't need it. That so, is outstanding. <laughs> That's great. That really is. Nice job. <laughs> so just, you know, mother of necessity is the mother of invention. So I actually made two of these and here, here are the two of them you can see. And they're made from half inch foil foam board, foam board insulation. And I just pinned them to match the fascia, put some L shape, um, Uh, brackets on there so that I could stick them up temporarily and I also added some felt onto the the brackets so that it, they don't scrape up the fascia here's the other side of them you can you can see the the brackets everything's attached by construction of adhesive the foam board with the foil is very strong so the one I ended up folding and I had to glue on the back side a couple of uh, paint stir sticks to stiffen it up. So here's just another spot on the layout that I, you know, you can see how close the track is. And if I just stick up Take that curved one, attach it temporarily. Now I can take a picture and it, it just looks like it's part of that because I've put the scenery material matches the material on the layout. Just another example, here's a spot on the layout. So I've attached this, in this case, the square one, mm -hmm. taking a picture. Now I don't worry about seeing the fascia. And again, all, all I've got is a couple of uh, wood clamps that hold that on there. Just stick it up onto there and then take the picture and then take it down and put it away. So I try and make you sh short, but short vegetation so I don't block my photos and I, I have no buildings or trees. I don't place any, anything distinctive on the surface so that I can use it anywhere and not if I put a, a fence or an outhouse what it, it would people would recognize that and say hey I've seen that before. So I make them just generic as possible with matching material. Here's a spot in which it was going to be difficult to take a photo but it's a, if you're in Baraboo, you know this spot because it's, it's, you know, the road goes across the main street. So I could attach one here, take a picture. And if you look kind of right below the locomotive, there's a, there's a little line 
in which case it didn't quite match up. And I found that when you're attaching these extensions, if you attach them a little higher, you won't see the, the, the budding of it and it'll just look like maybe there's a change in the slope. So mm -hmm. it's uh, an like easy little, way to take pictures. Looks like a ditch. Yeah, it just looks like a ditch. You pointed it out now. I, you pointed it out. And now all I do is see it. If you, hadn't <laughs> said anything, if you hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have seen it. And I should have just moved it and taken another picture, but I wanted to do that. So to explain that if I just raised that a quarter of an inch, I would yeah, not have yeah. noticed it. If I'd, if I'd raised it a whole inch, it would just look like the ground drops off into a ditch between the foreground and the, the layout itself. Yeah. You should submit that to one of the magazines. Do a, do a how-to. That's just really cool. Is, is that strong enough to support the camera? Yes, yes. So I, I, just, I just set the camera on it and position it wherever I want to take the picture. But you know, the, the brackets are wood. They're attached by cement, <clears throat> I mean, construction adhesive. The foil is very tough other than that one that I had bent it, but it, it's it, you know strong enough so you can set the camera on there, line up your picture and then take the picture. Now I've got one more thing I'm gonna talk about also. And I, I've enjoyed what have I been working on lately. So I've been working on two different things and one is stainless steel loads. And I've, there's an industry on the line outside of Baraboo that made stainless steel tanks. And even though I don't, my model railroad doesn't serve the industry, the way freight has to haul material to Walker stainless steel and it has to haul loads away from it. So I thought, well, I need to have loads that can move on in the way freight. So I did a, a couple things. In this picture here, I've got stainless steel traveling in a gondola and then a finished product that'll be hauled away from Walker stainless steel. They were shipping up till 1985. Um, you, on the railroad, they were shipping Every week they, they would have a tank, they, they would need, a, they would have a load to be shipped every week. So that's a, a pretty big deal now. What did you make the tank out of? <laughs> I had found this, I'm not even sure what it was at one time to tell you the truth. But I just added all kinds of extra piping onto it until it looked like something. The ends um, of it being round is the kind of the hard part to make, isn't it? It is, and this was something else. I just thought it'd be cool. And, and in the case, the Walker stainless steel in 85 was still shipping weekly, but they had stopped getting stainless steel because it was, was damaged so much. But I thought, well, if I model in an earlier time, it would be appropriate to bring in stainless steel. And I'm uncertain about uh, gondolas or I'd be better off some of those coil cars. But again, I know they shipped, I've got records that they shipped and received, but I have no pictures of it. So I don't know what it actually looked like, but I needed to have it. And here's another picture of that and I went online and that is a um, high volume pasteurizer tank, pasteurizing tank for milk is what that is. And I got some help from, uh, I wanna give credit to Doug Harding. He'd sent me a diagram for how they might actually secure these loads. 
and I intend to make some bigger ones because the Walker stainless steel made tanks up to 12 feet in diameter and up to 70 feet long. And that could make for a really impressive load. But now I, I, I do need some help from other people. You see, I've got a strap holding it down per the drawing, but I used wire and the wire is too big and clunky. And I used some finer wire, but it still doesn't work right. What I'd like to have is a black elastic thread. I assume that people who sew have this thing to make underwear or whatever so that it stretches. And if I could make, if I could have that, then I could make little hooks. And actually I wanna be able to take the loads on and off so I can put a different load on there. And it was elastic, I could stretch it, unhook it and then put it back on. So I'm looking for ideas. Mark, Mark have you ever been in Joanne Fabrics? Well, it's not one of the places I normally go. <laughs> might want, you might want to try it. Okay. Mark, another suggestion is to go into a fishing store and look at the different five pound, two pound lines for fishing line. It, okay. comes, it comes braided and it comes solid, but it has a distinct um, diameters for each test pound of the fishing line. Fly fishing line is great stuff. Because I want to make it, whatever it is, removable so I can take it off and then put a different load on there. Well, the fishing line, you could uh, put a glue surface over it so it would stay very rigid. And still, for once you got it conformed, you could then eventually put glue just on the, the pieces you, you want to go into the, the stake pockets and it would stay very rigid. You can use okay. AC, like cool. Lester saying, you can use ACC and stiffen it up. Yep. Yes. All right. It'll work well. That's a good idea. I'll have to give that a try. Now, I also made another load for Walker, Walker Stainless Steel. Uh, I was online, their website, and this is a raw milk bulk tank. And it doesn't have to be strapped down. It, it's got feet. And I assume they would use some wood and then tack the whole thing down to the deck of the... I also want to give credit here to Clark. A couple of weeks ago, he led me onto the idea that I could use prismatic pencils when he was had those wood box cars. So I use that on the decking here so I could weather individual boards. And that's just, you know, colored pencil. Now I'm gonna show you one more project. And this is of the unusual nature too. I model Baraboo, Wisconsin, and that's the headquarters of the Circus World Museum. And since 1965, not every year, but 40 times, they've hauled a circus train to Milwaukee or Chicago. And they, this particular orange car, they had two of them. And it was converted from a Milwaukee Road uh, baggage car. And they filled in the doors and cut in these windows. And it's normally open. They've got some uh, plexiglass windows that are up in the ceiling, they folded down just to keep the dirt out. So for me, it was necessary to have this so I can model the circus train that would operate once a year out of Baraboo. But this was gonna be a hard thing to do until another fellow from Baraboo does 3D printing and he 3D printed one of these. And it, it's, it looks kind of funny because his printer isn't big enough to make the full length laying down, but he can print it with all this webbing here at an angle and get the full 70 foot for the side. And in the right hand corner, there's actually a circus wagon that he also 3D prints. He does fabulous work. I'm going to put a plug in for Circus City decals. 
3D printing is only part of his business. He, he makes decals for all kinds of model, all kinds of railroads. And he also makes um, some parts for locomotives, unusual parts uh, like the air tanks on uh, torpedo tube GP7s, for instance. He also makes stuff for uh, ore ships. If you had a Great Lakes ore ship, he makes detailed parts to add to that. So it, it's crazy. Go to his website, Circus City Decals. So in the, to make the passenger car, I bought a Walther's kit, stripped the sides, the roof and everything off of it. It would happen to be a, a male baggage car, which I didn't need. And then I painted the the sides, he also have de has matching decals. So the Circus Square Museum had two of these. So this is the orange one. I'm also gonna build the green one too. But we had only one day last week above 60 degrees, which I could spray paint outside. And I might get one more chance in this next week and maybe I'll do the other car. Unfortunately, I, I probably looked at things uh, pay careful detail and on the ends I left the dot I weathered the diaphragm so they looked like they were used but then when I looked at the photos I realized that painted the diaphragms orange also so that'll give me one more project to do when uh, the weather gets warm enough for me to paint that's just over spray what's that that's just over spray when they painted the real car <laughs> I saw I saw that car up there and I I really do think it was just overspray because it's rather sloppy on the end. So, so you're familiar with the, the Great Circus Train then? I am, yes. In fact, I, I, I just had a fit when they stopped running it because the wagons that they were taking out of the museum, they were steel on steel. So the steel wheels on the wagons were sitting on the steel deck of the uh, flat cars, the circus flat cars. And they said they can't do that anymore because they're, they're liable to slide off. So that's why they stopped hauling that train. Well, that's not the only reason. It's, it's a very costly thing to do. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. And, and initially, in, starting in 1965, Schlitz uh, Beer Company sponsored it. And when they discontinued it, then it didn't happen for a few years. It went to Chicago because uh, Mayor Jane Burns, Chicago put up the money and they went there for two years and then it, it stopped and finally they got a new sponsor and it went back to Milwaukee until 2003 when that was the end of it. But that's been uh, that long now, huh? It's been that long, yeah. Wow. Now, I, grew, I grew up in Baraboo, so every July 4th, around then, I was down at the tracks watching them load the wagons and watching the train leave. I mean, it was a wonderful thing to grow up with. Oh, it, it had to be. Had to be. Absolutely. The original cars were had wood floors on them. They had, had one in the uh, undercover up there. and But the I guess at the end, those cars got so old, they probably couldn't use them anymore on the railroad. Well, which cars are you talking about? Flat cars with wood deck. Yeah, I, I don't know about the wood deck, but I think some of the, the flat cars used um, on the circus had wood decks on them, or the, the great circus train. Towards the end, they end up getting some newer equipment because they were running a fall of all kinds of they didn't have roller bearing trucks. Everything wasn't up to code. Yeah, the, you know the uh, the wood uh, the runners where the wheels went on. They had a uh, uh, a block which had a heavy cleats on them, and that's how they just dug them right into that wood to hold that that uh, wagon heavy wagon in place, along with some more ropes. And I think that they probably roped down the end of them, the end car. The end wagons. I've made that trip a number of times. 
it, it's worth it. It's it's really sad that it it's probably never going to happen again. And especially and nineteen. Moved, and you moved away. That was the other problem. <laughs> well, I did move back though in eighty six though. But I've moved away again now. But if if it happens again, I will be there. But the first five years were steam engines powered them. I mean, it was it was fabulous. And, the and then, well, they were, they, it wasn't thirteen eighty five. Um, One time, wasn't it? Oh yeah, thirteen eighty five. Oh, there were Burlington at least engine? Years, 85, 86, and 87. Though in 87, um, it was sitting at Baribu, spot ready to go, and it blew out its superheater, and they had to haul it back to North Freedom to work on. And there was an SD60 that was on the ballast train that they hooked into the front and then hauled it down to Janesville, which was the first day. And then late that night they they had the steam engine repaired 1385 and they ran down to Janesville and then it did lead the train so that's all I've got with these couple presentations that's great Mark I'm glad we Question. got that got glad you got your audio working I, I do not know why it didn't work because I downloaded an update for Zoom and let's just ho hope that it happens again. <laughs> yeah. But there's I, there's no guarantees to that. That's great now stuff. I got, to, I got to figure out how to get out of here now. Here, I can help with that. There we go. Want another Thank picture you. one? Yeah, sure, Ron. You want to do that? Yeah, I just have to find it. This, both of these are just strictly pictures tonight. Let's see if I can get up here. Well, Ron's looking for pictures. I can tell you a story about the circus train. I can't tell you what year it was, but um, I was in a ham radio club that helped run the circus parade with 35 different operators scattered around. And I had a two meter radio down at the lakefront and I was assigned to the guy that was general manager of the museum up in Baraboo, who worked for Chappie Fox. I can't remember the name of the guy I was with though. And he was starting the wagons in order. I was his communication guy and he was on horseback and I was on foot and had to keep up with him as he was <laughs> racing around the lakefront. And it was a very hot day and lots of mosquitoes in other parts of town. They weren't too bad down there, uh, 4th of July. And uh, after the parade was over and it took like three hours to pass any given spot, there was so much stuff in the parade, not just all the circus wagons, but uh, bands and marching units and you, know, you name it. Uh, I was driving home, heading up the freeway and blew a rod out of my engine Jammed, jammed it into neutral and uh, coasted over to the side. And uh, sheriff came along, said, uh, "Think you can get this thing off the freeway?" Nope. Can they call me a wrecker? Yep. And uh, so the wrecker came, and he said, "I can drop you off anywhere along the route, We're heading over to drop the car off at a dealer, but uh, otherwise you got to find your way from there." Well. Turns out he could only take me about half a mile and then I needed to go right angles from there. And I needed to walk, I think about three and a half miles home from there. And uh, mosquitoes everywhere. And uh, I had been chasing this guy on the horse all day long, hotter than heck, worn out, and then had to walk home. And that was a day I'll never forget, but I can't tell you exactly what day it was. I, I saw the circus parade several years and took pictures of 1385 pulling it and whatnot. And those are all in slides I've got that need to be scanned one of these days so I can share them. Neil, that's the second story you've told like that where you wind up stranded on the highway. Remind me not to ride with you. <laughs> <laughs> when Neil, when you're talking about the circus parade, is that on the Baraboo grounds? Or was this elsewhere? 
Oh, no. that was the one for the parade in Milwaukee. Oh, okay. I'm, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, they'd have like 650,000 people downtown watching that parade. That was a huge, huge event. There and, used to uh, be a uh, parade in Peru. Is, is that still going on? I don't know about that one. I've heard about it, but I've never been down there. And that's only uh, an hour and 45 minutes south of me. Yeah, that was another circus town. Had right. Brock and Wallace had it. Another winter headquarters in a cold location. Yeah. Yeah. Never figured that out. Okay. All right, Ryan, you're on. This is just a group of pictures. So, you know, if people see something that is of interest, why well, let's talk about it. Otherwise, it's just. A... Is that one of my son built? <laughs> Some of this we might have already seen before, too. I think uh, Rod may be making one of these uh, water wagons. I'm not sure. Ron, I've got one started. I haven't gotten very far on it. You know, this is, I think this is a water wagon right here. It's, it's a little different than the other one. It's a wood one. Yeah. It's kind of interesting that the steam engine is pulling that and the horses are pulling the thrash machine. Yeah, but they probably ran that steam engine to run the thrash. There it is, built. Okay. okay. Well, it's a little different one because you see that the, the uh, tank is different. Ron, you might describe to them how they got the water out of the tank, that Johnson pump up on top. Oh, yeah. You, you know it better than I do, Ron. Well, you sent me the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might have sent you the pictures, but I didn't know anything about it. Well, I'm sure they did it by hand. They just pumped... You know, whenever the uh, boiler uh, needed water, why they, by hand, pump. They did. Uh, that, diagonal, that diagonal rod is the hand pump. Yep. Right there, yeah. Yep. Yes. That's a Meyer hand pump, by the way. A Meyer? Not Meyer, du Meyer dual action hand pump. My son makes pistons for them. You wouldn't have diagrams for him, would you, Ken? I don't know. I'll ask him. Because I'd like to model one. Okay. HO scale. <laughs> Boy, that would be tiny. Yeah, I know. Wow. Um, I think I, I I will find out. I'll ask my son uh, tomorrow. He's in Iowa working on a steam engine this weekend. Maybe he has pictures of up close of an old one or something. I'm sure he does. Sure. Be glad to help you. Because most of what I've seen are the scale of picture that Ron has shown there where it's Hard to decipher. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> they would throw the hose in the lake or into a creek and pump water out into the tank. Right. Yep. And there'd be a filter on the back end of it, a, a, a brass filter. Um, and then they would reverse the situation, getting it into the end, getting it into the tank on the engine, not into the boiler. That's under pressure. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing was the water quality sometimes was was very suspicious. Um, if you got it out of a well, it would be sometimes you would be they'd smell it and it, it smelled like rotten eggs. You couldn't put it in your boiler over the engine because it would foam up. You know what's interesting in that photo is on the far right is that rounded tank underneath the guy who's sitting on the. Well, I think it's a second water tank. I No, guys, I think that's, uh, if you look at the threshing machine, if you remember, uh, the grain would come out. I really believe that's a grain wagon, and that's what's catching the grain. Oh, I used wait, to pitch, wait, wait, are you, which one, on the right or the left? The one on the left side. That is definitely the old That one right there with the guy, that's I believe the, that's where the grain, uh, there was a grain chute, remember off the, uh, just like the straw chute. I used to pitch bundles into those as well as a teenager and uh usually you had uh a grain wagon uh sitting on the side that would collect whether it be the oats or whatever was going you know you were threshing this is a big rig because they're throwing in bundles from two wagons here's a wagon on this side here's a wagon on that side full of uh bundles of whatever oats or you wheat. ron 
Ron, we used to uh, pitch those on when I worked when I worked on my grandfather's farm. Even though what the size of the machine, we would a lot of times have two wagons going because then you had to pitch what make sure the uh, the the shock you know the field was shocked at that time a lot of times before the combines and you had to make sure the head of the shock went in first to shake the grain loose in the machines and then it would normally collect in that wagon which was hauled off to a greenhouse. All right. Notice there's a guy up here on the uh, the uh, straw pile and he is. Uh, how flat and uh, that it is. I mean, they used that straw, and they the they, the better that yep. he stacked it, the better that it kept through the winter. Correct. Yep. Yep. And it would be in a kind of a half uh, crescent shape because this the blower here would would uh, you could you could turn it so that it did yep. you could it be stationary or so that it would turn in a crescent shape. I think yep. though what uh, Rod was talking about was this wagon back here, but oh, that, that might be full of wood. That's his fuel wagon. That's the what wagon? Fuel. fuel. Yeah. Yep. Wood whether or coal, whatever they're whether it's, whether it's coal or wood, it's not yeah. straw. It's not a straw feeder. Not it's not one. a straw burner. And look at the black smoke. Well, he just he's just firing it. He just threw yeah. some wood in or some coal. That's all. I don't know whether you'd see that kind of color though with straw. I don't know. Not it, much. It's pretty clear. It burns clear. That's what I would think. Okay, so let's. This is the round barn area. I'd like to build one of these. I got to find something to uh, to make the roof, and I think the easiest way is to find somebody with a uh, lathe that can take and make a round uh, uh, cap for me. I think the bottom part can be made out of cardboard or whatever and a paper cover over it. Here's another one. Interesting, this one has a uh, rock first floor. Yep. These apparently are of new pictures. I think Doug Hardy sent them to me. That, that's unusual. I don't know, you know, putting the shingles on a dome like that would be a, uh, <laughs> I think that's concrete. Don't you think that's concrete down here? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. God, I've never seen it. All right, then we move into uh, some railroad stuff. You don't see guys hanging on the side of the car anymore. That's a pretty big elevator. You wonder if that's uh, something uh, in some big city or uh, perhaps up at the Great Lakes area. But it's on the nickel plate, I guess. I don't think I showed this before. This is the old Milwaukee Tama station. It was brick. And uh, this was after passenger trains stopped running. This, if you model the, a wood car, this is really a great picture for detail. You can see the, uh, the thing that holds the uh, ratchet when it's uh, tight. The paw. Yeah, the paw. Paw. The relief. Uh, uh, the Retainer valve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's always a controversy exactly how high this is. But I think the guy standing on this that determines a, a, the height that would be convenient for him to hang onto that and turn the wheel. That's how you determine how high to make that brake shaft if it's, <coughs> excuse me. If you don't have this platform, he's standing up here on the car doing that. So therefore it'd be a higher uh, brake shaft. Well, the minimum was 12 inches. Per, uh, per safety standards when they came out, the minimum clearance was 12 inches from the roof yeah. to the wood. That had to be the minimum. But on, this there was no, of car, uh, on this type of car where you can stand here, the minimum is from here to here is 12 inches. Right. But there is nothing in any of the books telling you what the maximum is. Correct. Yep. Ex agree. 
Yep. I like that. We uh, we had a very large uh, timber area, and we had a lot of walnut logs. And when I was a kid, we sold walnut logs, and the Milwaukee uh, hauled them away. They would put seventy logs in a gondola. Huh. Eight foot long. And when we usually model, we we don't put very many logs in. But I think that's probably because we make the logs too big. I mean, that's not a very big log. Right. And they celebrate it, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's the band. <laughs> the tuba and the... <laughs> I suspect Blue River is up in Wisconsin, maybe, huh? Blue River is along the Wisconsin River on Milwaukee Road between Madison and Prairie du Chien. I think my dad told me that those walnut logs went to Japan. They're still cutting walnut in our area, and they process them initially in Reedsburg, and then they ship them to Germany, and they're made into gun stocks. I really thought this was a great picture. I mean, uh, the guy loading scrap by hand out of a couple of trucks. Yeah. You know. Labor was cheap. Yeah, Labor well, that'd cheap. be great on our uh, model railroad, wouldn't it? A small, uh, you don't even have to have the junkyard there. And how many people will put white wall tires on a truck? <laughs> Very good. How about this truck doesn't have a top on it? Those white walls probably came off of a car when they went to change tires and get new tires. They probably were on their last legs. <laughs> Recycle as much as you could. Well, you know, the car, when we took the tires off the car, we put them on wagons, as long as they would hold air. <laughs> if, if I may, there's a, a on scrap story. When I was researching um, yeah. Yeah. one of the foundries, and they were, you know, they used to use spring in scrap loads in the foundry and to, uh, to pour, make steel. And, you know, on the building I was at, there was there were no doors on the back of the building, just windows. And I asked the plant manager or the foundry guy, manager, well, wait a minute, how did you unload, un unload those steel cars? And he said, guy, we'd go down to the local uh, labor area, pick up 20 guys. He said labor was cheap and they toss it in the windows. So they had no doors for security. Or they put toss all the scrap into the furnace, into an uh, area that went into the furnace uh, via window. <clears throat> you don't often find uh, colored pictures of the Great Western's uh, mail uh, uh, postage mail car. So I thought that was worth keeping. That is, that's neat. I saw these as a kid. I'll tell you, I saw those trains many times headed toward Chicago or headed toward Omaha. They always came through about the same time at night around 4 35 o'clock. Beautiful sight. I remember them going through the smoke blowing like crazy, and it just like it would turn everything from day to night. Here's a few pickle ones. We don't need to spend a lot of time, but we were long time, a couple of days ago, we talked about pickles. These are all, uh, as far as I know, rubber, or pla I don't think rubber, but plastic uh, tanks. This is up at Bangor. It's a Freestone Pickle Company. And you see how they cover them up in the night, after they've got pickles in them. Boy, there's a bunch of them up there. Well, I think we talked a little bit about uh, shelling corn in the field. Uh, you know, before uh, they had combines and stuff that shelled the corn right when they picked it. Corn was all picked in the ear and then they put it in corn cribs to dry it out. 
And when the corn price went up, why out came a guy with his uh, portable sheller and uh, he, that's what he's doing. You can see the, the uh, shelled corn coming out here. Here's the husks and stuff here. And back here is the, uh, uh, where the cobs are coming out. Although I kind of wonder if it looks like this corn is actually on the ground. So the cobs would be over, not into the corn, it would, it's in between. So I, someday I may make one of those. I, I've got it started. If you ever wanted to see what my la railroad looked like, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the end. All right. <clears throat> Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, we've like got time too. Yeah, it's about right. Yep, just perfect. Um, we've got Brian lined up for next week. We could take one or two more if you guys are up for it. Let me know. And uh, thanks very much, Mark and Ron, for presenting. That was very interesting and enjoyable. And uh, great ideas on that uh, on that extension to the to the fascia. Who wanted the picture of the Meyer tank or the Meyer pump? That's Rod Thompson. Okay. Um, yes, my son has one. A picture. So we'll figure out how to get to him. All right. That's great. I, he rides muted, so he might have stepped away or something. If you could get it to us, we could put it out for everybody if it's. If oh, sure. That'd can, be fantastic. Can, yeah. Send That'd it to super. everybody. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it on the email. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. That's okay. That's great. Time and effort is valuable. Thanks. Yeah, very much so. That's all, all right. he does is old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> God love him. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining. We'll see you next week. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.